Welcome back to part three of about five million. Uh, this uh, looking at the impacts of World War II in Europe. This one is going to look overall at the peace treaties and the overall uh, social impacts. And you've seen these learning outcomes before. Keep at it. Which brings us to um, the Paris Peace Treaties in 1947. Uh, this was basically what the Council of Foreign Ministers uh, came up with in 1947. By the time we get to 1946, um, uh, France has joined the Council of Ministers, day late, mm -hmm, dollar short, I don't know. And, um, and they come up with these uh, series of uh, treaties dealing with the aggressors of World War II. And so in looking at the Paris Peace Treaties of 1947, again, this is the US, the Soviet Union, Britain, and France um, negotiating these treaties with Italy, Romania, Hungary, Bulgaria, and Finland. And what they were hoping to do here, or one of the biggest things, was essentially to not repeat the mistakes that they had made um, at the end of World War I, which, as you know, was pretty much a spectacular failure. And um, so these treaties allowed these countries to uh, be sovereign, independent states and um, be part of the international community. So you don't have the ostracism that was faced by um, the losers of World War I. And it also set out um, for membership in the United Nations. One of the biggest things, of course, about this is that it um, handles uh, reparations. Um, and there were very heavy reparations uh, for all of these countries. And the Soviet Union felt the most entitled um, uh, because of the destruction that she faced and so on and so forth. So basically Italy had to pay 360 million, Finland 300 million, Hungary 300 million, Romania 300 million, and a significant portion, probably a good two thirds of that, or maybe one third of that, um, had to essentially, more than 50% of it, I know, I'm ham and hawing, but you guys know me in numbers, not friends. Uh, had to basically go to the Soviet Union. And if anybody is interested in finding out, um, uh, when the Soviet Union fell apart, there was no revision of this treaty. So I wonder if these countries are still paying these reparations um, to Russia or, I don't know, to somebody. All right. One of the biggest things, of course, um, is that these treaties required that um, these countries recognize the rights, the human rights of minorities within their borders and um, to protect those rights. So this is essentially coming from um, the, uh, the Holocaust and how all of those various groups who were um, quote unquote undesirables in society were um, murdered. And so this was the end and attempt to guarantee human rights uh, for those smaller groups. Um, one of the things that they worked to do was to prevent the reestablishment of fascism. So those um, treaties said that these governments uh, had to make sure that fascism would not come about again. And so um, um, and so basically they, you know, s some things were outlawed, so on and so forth. And um, we have massive border changes. We'll look at some maps a little later on. And, um, and Italy loses her African colonies. So essentially, um, uh, the Abyssinian invasion is uh, annulled and uh, Libya, gets to have independence. And, um, and as stated previously, uh, these countries were not to be occupied um, and, and were not to be sort of um, uh, directly managed by outside organization. And so they had to establish democracy and then um, thereby qualify for UN membership. 
And so here we have an image of Warsaw, Poland. And as you can see, and I've shown you these pictures before, just different cities, um, showing you essentially that this destruction wasn't just isolated in certain areas the way that it was in World War I. Because of airplanes, because of terror bombing, it, ha it is across the entire continent. All right. And as we know, um, war has massive, 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 massive uh, social changes. And here we go. So uh, one of the biggest things about World War II is that we have the massive movement of people. Uh, as stated previously, we have millions, literally millions of refugees from German-speaking areas. As borders shifted, um, people were forced to move. Essentially, um, uh, you know, at the end of World War I, they tried to create states to um, reflect the ethnic um, composition of areas, and that failed. And so now what they're doing is the borders are not changing quite so much, but they're moving people to form the, to, to change the ethnic composition of areas. And one of the biggest things that they wanted to do is kind of like remove that idea of Lebensraum, remove that idea of like pan-Germanism. Um, and so instead of, you know, like the, the millions of people you have, of Germans you have li living in the Sudetenland are going to be forced to move. The millions living in East Prussia are going to be forced to move, et cetera, et cetera. There is a massive exodus of Jews from Europe, and this is going to be um, really kind of detrimental because what you have is a loss of, a, um, of a human capital. And so you have a lot of people who were involved in the sciences, you know, people who had been um, pushed out of academia and stuff were leaving uh, Russia, were leaving um, Poland, Germany, um, Eastern Europe, and so a lot of people moved to the U.S., and then eventually you have the establishment of the country that shall not be named, um, and you have a massive resettlement of people into um, Israel. I named it. I'm living on the wild side. All right. We also have this massive change in social welfare. So, um, oops. So we also have this massive change in social welfare. One of the things that happens is there's this recognition by the governments um, that there needs to be more um, social support for people. Uh, and the idea, of course, is, or part of it is, um, you know, uh, the problems that happened with people um, with massive unemployment during the Great Depression. And the idea now is the government should be mitigating some of that. The other thing that happens is um, this has been happening since the uh, World War I, is you have a um, uh, opening of the franchise to more people, that is more average, normal, working class people can participate in the government and can vote. And one of the things that um, people are worried about is social support. So essentially one of the things that happens is a lot of the stuff that like the socialists had been pulling for, now remember socialism, different than communism, had been pulling for in terms of of redistributing some of the wealth of the society to all of its members in the case of like healthcare and education and um, uh, retirement benefits, so on and so forth, become an integral part of uh, the country's um, political system. And we have a massive loss of elites. So, um, so for example, a lot of the people in Czechoslovakia, as the Germans were forced to move out, you have um, elites of industry, of banking, whatever, are forced to leave. The um, exodus of uh, the mass movement of, of Jews out of Europe. You also have the... Um, 
movements of people who are just kind of disillusioned with the whole system who had been pushed out of like the academics who had been pushed out of the arts so on and so forth are leaving uh, Europe and what that leads to is some retarding of development so you already have countries that are in very very dire straits like economically and and now the the human capital um, that is needed to help rebuild that infrastructure that has um, the expertise to push the country forward uh, is leaving and that's going to have a negative impact on the overall development of the countries. And um, one of the things, of course, is uh, the deployment of nuclear bombs. If this ushers in the nuclear age. Um, now we have, and we're still dealing with the fallout. Bum bum. Uh, I hope you got that joke. Of um, of this today, because not only was um, nuclear technology used uh, for weaponry, like in the atomic bombs, but now you have um, it being used uh, for things like um, power stations, for um, things like uh, medical equipment, and so on and so forth. A lot of experimentation, a lot of development in the sciences, and so, um, the post-war period is one is a nuclear age. And of course, as the um, Cold War heats up, it really, really becomes to the center stage. And um, this you see with threats of brinkmanship and use as a deterrent between the um, West and the US and um, uh, Russia. And as stated before, the there's there's this the post-war period, um, despite these development of the Cold War, in many, many places, it is this really big time of optimism because people feel like they can change the world with technology and make the world a better place. And um, and of course, they're coming off of this like incredible high of having like, you know, um, opposed fascism and won. And so there are these benefits of nuclear technology that are being used in hospitals to help cure cancer um, and to develop uh, new machines like MRIs and so on and so forth. 